Thank you. Hello, everybody. So uh, I said, my, my name is Steve Gill. I'm chief exec of IHP Analytics. Um, it's a company founded out of Formula One and Elite Sport. Uh, I'm pleased to be here today. I'd make a warm welcome to everybody dialing in where, wherever you may be. Uh, we're the last one in session. Uh, hopefully that's not an omen. I think it's probably a good omen that we have got some exciting things to talk about and to show you. Uh, my background, uh, as previously said, is, is aerospace and Formula One. I used to be chief exec of uh, Red Bull Formula One Advanced Technologies. Um, and that has a big play in terms of my, my guest. I'm really pleased to welcome an ex-colleague uh, and a friend, Andy Walsh. And for those that don't know Andy, Andy used to be uh, an old colleague. He was the head of human performance for Red Bull head office. Uh, and he's now co-founder of the Liminal Collective. Andy, welcome. Hey, thank you, Steve. And uh, yeah, welcome to everybody who's uh, patient enough to hang around for the day. I'm, uh, I'm excited to have this conversation. Great. Well, you're, you're really welcome, Andy. Good to, good to see you again. I thought before we get started, for, for those people that don't know you and in the world of elite sport, that won't be many people. I think you're a household name in, in elite sport. But for, for the audience that, that don't know you, uh, it'd be good to understand the uh, the man behind the myth. So, you know, probably good to start with what got you interested in, in elite performance and you know, where did it all start? Ah, great question. Uh, so actually, I was... Uh, as, as my initial training in my undergrad program was as a, a combination of human movement and coaching. And one of the first things that they do with you in that program many years ago in the University of Sydney is they send you out to the schools and you start to practice being a teacher. And so they gave me a bunch of five-year-olds to take care of for several weeks. And uh, I reckon that's probably the pinnacle of my career because managing a 30 young children uh, in an active and in PE sort of physical environment was really, it set me up. It was a it was a, a wake up call on one level, but it also showed us, I think for me, it just rekindled a passion of how, you know, you could use, you know, human performance uh, and, and you could understand what really goes into how a person brings their best self to, a, to any sort of area of mastery, whether it's sport or uh, creatives, uh, business, you know, government. And uh, really for me, it was, it started way back then. Uh, I really enjoyed the interaction of coaching and then the coaching led to higher level sort of degrees in human performance. And then I just got really lucky and I got to spend time uh, in multiple hot human performance scenarios, Olympic sports, government programs, professional teams, uh, creatives, designers, filmmakers, and over the years just sitting there and listening to them talk about their stories of how they did what they did. It was it's just fascinating. I'm still fascinating to this day. And I would like to say we, we've learned a lot, but I, I think there's a, a massive runway ahead of us of what we really need to understand to help people uh, yeah, yeah, at the top of their game. All those, all those great things that you've done, which I know a few of them, obviously, within the Red Bull family. But, you know, what, what would you consider the greatest one of all? If you had to, and that's a really difficult question. Uh, there are so many, but if you had to put your money on one uh, and, you know, and crown it with your professional achievement, where would you, where would you put it? Ah, oh, that's a great question. Um, every one of the experiences, every one of the programs we get to support and, and, and sort of collaborate with teaches you something fresh. I think the one that's still to this day probably the areas of, area of greatest intrigue and one we're really fascinated with, it was the, a project we started called Hacking Creativity. We were trying to... You think in the traditional sense of elite sport, you're looking at all the biomarkers, the quanti qualitative and quantitative yeah. things you can look at to understand how a person's performing. But when you think about those people really at the top of their game, really tip of the spear kind of performers in any field, they are reimagining what's possible for that given area of mastery. They are redefining how things are going to be done for generations to follow. And that's a creative process. So understanding kind of measuring what can't be measured the, the creative process and that project we set up which ran for a couple of years where we interviewed high level creatives we opened it to the public and had about fifteen thousand people participate the whole goal of it was to really try and understand what it means to sort of enhance creativity not to define it clearly not to try and say hey this is what you do but just to sort of improve our knowledge and the you know, we interviewed, as I said, high-level creatives. We we had a public participation in a sort of broader sense. But what was really staggering for me at that time was we partnered with a group called Primer AI with the early iteration, and we actually had the machine 
uh, go out and read thousands and thousands, 15,000 papers, I think, at the time on creative process and ingest it all and give us that data point that you could then layer the human sort of perspective on top. And that I think that today is informing just about every way forward for us in terms of all our processes working with uh, people. Yeah. So you know, without, without sounding bleak, so if, uh, you know, you, you're on, on the old tombstone and you wanted to be remembered by something, what, what would you want on there? Well, I think, uh, you know, coming full circle back to my family, it's, it's that thing I'd like to think about how for them just some of the things we've learned I've passed down to my two twin girls who are both 10 years old now. But I think more broadly, if we could unpack some of the tools and techniques that people have developed and used to really manage themselves in whatever their performance environment might be. It might be just managing a job and, and putting food on the table. It might be an elite performance in some sporting endeavour. But unpacking those lessons learned from all the community that we get to work with and <clears throat> making that openly available. These things, as you know, Steve, aren't complex. They're not, they're not, they're not, they're not tricks. They're just the sort of democratization of all these tools and techniques, I think, would be a, a fantastic thing. I think if every kid in the world had access to some of the tools that we've developed, and I know you developed a lot as part of the uh, racing program, it, it, it sort of think about they could stand up a level and, and sort of navigate their own challenges with a little bit more, uh, hopefully, uh, insight and maybe get them to take it to another level and help us solve, you know, the big challenges that are coming down the pipe for sort of humanity at scale. Yeah, so one thing you mentioned there is you know with elite sport, it's that word elite, isn't it? So you know, to the to the to the to the lay person, it's it's the spectacle that you look at and it's you know, how do they do that? How do these guys constantly just keep you know marginal gains getting better and better? But you know, I think one thing Red Bull did do with the fan base it have is bring that excitement right to people's armchairs and obviously great live events. So, you know, I suppose what a great thing would be to ask is when you're managing the the uh uh, the team at, Re at Red Bull, the athletic team, if you had to choose one athlete that stood out the most in the great variety of things they did from snowboarding to skydiving and well, probably excluding Felix's inner space dive because that was a bit way out there. Mm -hmm. uh, which, which athlete, I'll probably allow you two if you've got a close a close one and two, which which athlete or athletes impressed you the most? In terms it's, of a great, it's a great question. Um, you know, uh, it just changes, I think, because you're always learning. And as you're going through, I think right now we're still working with one, Rebecca Rausch. She was staggering in us. She was kind of quietly doing her craft. She's a, a world-class endurance athlete, mountain biker, just one about every long-distance record there is. She recently competed on the Iditarod. Uh, on a bike and, and did that for the second time. And, and, and just now listening to her reflections as she sort of moved from this ideal of sort of she being at the top of a game in an athletic sense to this sort of, I don't want to put words in her mouth, but my under sort of reflections from her, she's sort of showing us how she's now thinking more broadly, how, how she can take what she's done in that field, all the things she's learned, just like we spoke about in the, in the previous question, mm -hmm. and, and now make an impact, really share that with the world. And, and, and I think right now that's, she's always impressive. She's always been, you know, staggering in what she's achieved. But I think right now watching that transition sort of moving from that sort of elite level of mastery in one field and then broadening out to how can I make a difference? How can I really help people? And uh, for that, it's fantastic. And then, you know, it, you know, there's so many. I, it, it's, it's not fair to pick one, but uh, right now that's the one that's really strikes me as fascinating and just I, I'm so excited about what she's going to be able to uh, do for people. Yeah, it was amazing. You know, even though we were in, in, the, in the F1 bubble with the, you know, the advanced technologies, and as, as as on the front foot as that was with cutting edge technology, we always had to smile when something came out from head office in terms of human performance, you know, and even to us in our world, it was some amazing things. And I think, you know, to bring that to everyone and the events to, to the normal people, I think that kind of links in with the, the title, you know, the high stakes environment and, uh, you know, people could say, well, what's that mean to us? You know, where, where does that translate today? And, you know, you've got massive conversations on, you know, can people keep getting better? You've got that transhumanism piece with, you know, are, are machines going to, to meld with people? You know, where, where do you sit on all that in terms of that, uh, that future of elite sport? I think elite sport or elite performance in any field, let's take the arts. I think what's really, really 
fascinating for us is that it typically just shows you a north star. I think um, it's easy, to, as you say, to put it on a mantle and sort of say, wow, how does that even possible? How does that apply to me? But I think what you understand is that these people have spent their lifetime focusing in this particular area typically, and so they show you what's possible. But let's be fair, everybody is still challenged by the same things. Fundamentally at the base level, we're still a human being or a team of humans, and, and, the, and the basic constraints that sort of, sort of support you, allow you to push through or even get in your way are very similar. And I think uh, so the elite programs, with whatever your field of mastery, really just show you what's possible but I think that the, the, the big sort of secret of our industry, as you know, Steve, is that there is, you know, the, the same challenges they're facing in, in their own way are the very similar fears and, 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 and sort of anxiety and, and joy and, and, and sort of love and hate of the whole thing. It's very similar to everybody and it's just that they're obviously pushing on, on a certain level. So I think that's the sort of interesting thing for us. Yeah, and I think there's that question as well is, you know, the elite sport, you, you obviously have to, have, have, have a gift in terms of what you're doing but you know then it's not cheap is it it's quite expensive in terms of you know entering entering that arena and you know with big sponsorship it's a lot easier but you know there are certain people I suppose you know how do we how do we make it more encompassing to to the people that just don't quite get those big sponsorship deals and you know make it affordable if we if you're going to miss talent I suppose that's the, the crux of the question. Yeah, I think what's again you think about this. It's expensive not only in the you know the, the monetary cost, but the, the expense is also on the rest of your life. Yeah. If you're going to push the boundaries in that particular field, wherever it is, right to the edge, very commonly we see the that the person has to let go of a lot of other things that they just uh, you know should or could be so paying attention to. And I think in that regard, it's. It's almost, it's sort of like elite performance, and kind of again, the, the sort of in, in, in the community, it's, it's great, but it's not sustainable. You just can't keep pushing that edge right at the very top forever and ever. And you know, physically, it can have a detrimental effect, you know, the amount of training and things, the costs, you know, monetary is obviously, as you say, very expensive. And then, you know, I think the uh, sort of, uh, the sort of non-economic cost is what are you giving up? What's the what's what's being left behind? So you get focus. And I think nowadays there's a there's a big shift to try and understand how do you still allow people at times to push out and really drive things right at the edge, but also how do you regenerate? How do you recover? How do you focus? I think what's sort of really powerful in this sort of you know, euphemistically named COVID experience is that people have many people have in fact frankly most of the world has been exposed to some of these challenges and, and I think what's happening is you're seeing people have, 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 have really tried to figure out how to bring their best self forward but it's been tough and I think these are the sorts of things that sort of you know the costs if you say of people pushing the edge there's always you know the other side of the coin so to speak. Yeah yeah so I, I just say to everybody watching if you've you know, got some questions please feel free to to start posting them in and we'll aim to if they're if they're timely when we're discussing, Andy's got some great slides that we'll we'll, we'll get up in a minute and have a chat together on uh, what Andy's doing and what um, what we're doing at IHP. Um, but yeah, f feel free to have the questions in, and I think we're leaving probably ten minutes at the end or so. <coughs> hopefully, after them all. So yeah, please send them in. Um, so I'll get a presentation up now, Andy. We're, we're obviously with pictures speaking better than words. Um, I think it'd be really interesting for people to see particularly some of the extreme fight or flight response training that, that you've done. Uh, while I'm doing that, I mean, it would obviously now you're with Liminal and you're a co-founder of Liminal. So, you know, for people, again, that may not have heard of Liminal, so what's the idea there, you know, and, and, and who's coming up with all these great ideas? How is that different to what you did at Red Bull? Um, you know, in many ways, it was sort of just taking lessons from what our, my, the previous career and Red Bull in particular and sort of saying, how do we even broaden the scope of this. And the fundamental idea behind Liminal is sort of a global community of thought leaders in sort of human performance uh, from all fields and people that we've worked and and sort of engaged with for many years. And, and the idea was simple. It's like, well, if we could bring that global community's knowledge to projects, to either elite sort of groundbreaking uh, uh, events or, or, or activities, or if we could just even capture their IP and what's in their minds and, and share it and democratize it. So. Really, that's the idea is sort of like if you think about sort of enabling our boldest endeavors as humanity, 
And we have this staggering global community of people who are just passionate about the edge of human and pushing humans through that through through that next level. You can then just bring that crew or that group together and focus them on these projects per se. So the ideas that come through are either, um, you know, people bring them to us, things that we get come up with, but you're trying to just basically bring that horse power to a project. It's sort of the running joke is anything's possible because of the depth of the community, you know, and people like yourselves, you know, sort of if something comes across the table and you're really thinking, well, how do we bring our best intellect and knowledge to that problem set? And so sort of let's bring that really uh, multi-dimensional uh, thought leadership to the problem and then identify a path forward and then just try and push. So that's the fundamental idea behind Liminal. And then as we're doing that, how do we democratize those ideas and those lessons so that everybody has access so people can watch and observe and see okay that's something interesting maybe even inspirational but really are there two or three things i can take home and use in my day-to-day -day life no matter who you are yeah that's something we've we've as you know we've we've, we've done and uh, doing very successfully with ihp where we're taking that learnings from elite sport and uh, olympic cycles and f1 and we're we're addressing for the for the normal person, I suppose, what it means to them in their work-life balance, you know, and how we measure these things. And, you know, so what, what does that mean? Well, I think we're, you, you coined it earlier, Andy, we're, we're able now with that technology that's available to the workplace for the first time to measure what was previously unmeasurable, because mm -hmm. you know, if I said fitness to you and fitness to someone else, it's a bit subjective. It means completely different things to all people. So we wanted to come up with a system that, was able to be understood by both scientists uh, and and the normal person, you know, and, and it's how do you empower them to have a better work-life balance. So, as you said before, it's bringing that that glamorous area of elite sport and that learning, um, which F1 did very well when they're, they're bringing it into industry. You know, yes, you have a bigger checkbook than most people, but the, there's a lot to learn. And the, there was always a very good association between aerospace and, uh, and F1 and other industries keen for the advancement in technology. So uh, I'll try and uh, share some slides there. We've had a few technical issues, but uh, hopefully it will work. So let me just bear with me one second. Yeah, and as you're doing that, Steve, I think you've learned as, probably as much as anyone that people are fascinated by some of these ideas. And if you just give them an entry point like you have, you'll see that they love uh, you know, some of these insights. It's not for everybody. It's definitely a different layer, you know, depending on where you're at. But I think you've, you're seeing right now that the things you've learned in F1 are translating very well with respect to um, how you can take those lessons apply them to you know people in the in the workplace for his example and they can take some things out of it that will have an impact if they choose to do that so i think that it's a fascinating part of uh um what we're doing and and i think that's the promise again the, again the elite programs whatever they may be they they, yeah. they have to push they learn these things uh, and they rehearse them and they train them and so they fine tune them they test them out so that the people who are you know jumping in um can sort of just not have to go through all that and fundamentally yeah. take those things and, and work with them. Yeah, and they need, you know, your you, you technology would be fantastic. In that environment, you know, you're employing very bright people that have a, a very specific job to do. But if you're gonna bring it to the general workplace or the, the, the wider the wider populace, it needs to be something that's easy to use, it needs to be easily understood, and it needs to be robust. You know, so with that in mind, obviously, we've got a few slides that we can uh, talk to. So hopefully that's working and everybody can see the slides. Um, uh, we did touch on this earlier, but good to put a few pictures to it. So, uh, uh, Andy, do you want to start with uh, uh, probably your experience, either with Felix or Special Operations? Because this gives a good spread of, of all the diverse areas that you've uh, applied this uh, elite performance thinking and what it means to those particular individuals doing those activities. Yeah, I'll talk to that. Uh, I, I can't see the slides, so I'm not sure if everyone else can't see them either. So maybe reshare. But the, mm -hmm. I think if you're thinking about sort of the topic today, high stakes performance, uh, mm -hmm. part of our community is involved in you know uh, all aspects of that. So whether you think at the, the elite sport level, uh, you know the communities that we've had engaged and, and and shared information with there, you've got the creative community, and some of our founders are in the directly from the Cirque, uh, Cirque du Soleil group, but also more broadly, just dance, movement, arts, film, uh, thinking about what they've learned about 
that performance that has to count when it counts and putting it up there. Obviously, the government stuff, uh, the, you know, the the special forces stuff is a, is an obvious one. People can see that, you know, when you are in these uh, no fail scenarios, you have to develop a certain skill set in terms of how you train, how you approach the the mission itself, how you select, how you assess, how you then unpack all that to learn and move forward. So those skills we've brought forward, and I think just more broadly. There's opportunities to even go beyond that to things like, you know, just communities who are who are thriving and flourishing in even challenging scenarios. And we did some work at one time, um, sort of social entrepreneurs and helping them in, in, in some of the underserved communities around the world. And, you know, if you want to talk about grit and resilience and, and, and the ability to cope with challenges that would probably put most of us on our, in our seats, that community shared so much. It's, it's funny, you can take a lesson from a, you know, a person trying to build a startup in a township in, say, Soweto and draw lessons from that translate directly over to someone who's trying to compete on the upcoming Olympic Games and, and, and they learn from both of us. So the, I think the idea is um, you're sharing across these communities. You, you're literally just moving information between them because they're so focused and so uh, uh, dedicated to what they do. They tend to end up, you know, a, a little narrow in their field of view. So... You know, it's the running joke in our in our crew is this sort of really we're not we're, we're kind of rock soup we're just putting the, the the scenario together bringing the talent in and the talents doing the the coaching and sharing yeah are those pictures coming up now and yeah now they look great yeah i think yeah, just good. Good. So. <laughs> so what, what, what did you guys do with the uh, cirque du soleil because obviously that's probably you know, obviously highly skillful but more of more in the family arena um, well, what's, yeah, what's challenging, again, back to the high stakes performance conversation, you know, you're trying to broaden these ideas of how to perform in high, high stakes, high sort of risk, high threat environments. And you are really, um, you know, that if you, if you use a physical example, a lot of people aren't even interested in learning how to be pushed physically. It doesn't make sense. And why would it? So even for our top physical athletes, if you look at uh, one of our best surfers in the world, if you try to put them in an even bigger surf, it's, it's impossible. You just can't challenge them in that environment because they're so used to it. And plus they have a lot of tools and techniques. Hmm. But Cirque has a staggering program they call uh, Athlete to Artist where they take you and they put you up on stage and you do improv and try to tell jokes. And, and so if you're taking someone who's used to surfing massive swells in the north shore of Hawaii, yeah, maybe push them a little harder in that environment, but that's challenging, even dangerous. Drag them out and put them on stage and tell them to make the room laugh for the next All 10 right. minutes. They buckle, and right. as they should, and it's done in a way that's supportive, but you are giving them a, a challenge that they're not, they're not used to, they're not common to, and that's how we train people to think about pushing their edges in places where they want to perform greater. We, we've obviously got to train them in their area, in their craft, but really you get great. The gold is in bringing them into other environments where they don't have any kit, they don't have any history, and maybe their skills are not tuned, and then they have to relearn. They have to get in that beginner's yeah. mind. Yeah. So obviously, with the, just just going through the, the key slides in the deck, I mean, you know, here we've got the human stress response, and you know, your your points on uh, evolutionary biology. Just just to the to the layperson, how would you how would you describe the thinking there? Well, I think here's the thing, uh, you know, the basic, you know, when you look at the human system, a uh, human individual, one, it's the most complex entity in the universe, one human, with the, if you sort of look at the breakdown of the cells and, 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 and the, what's going on, it's, it's the most complex thing we know about. Two, it's, uh, we don't know a lot about it, so everything we sort of think about, we know, we sort of got a gut check all the time, I always say, you know, in our industry, you, you got to keep this deep, deep sense of humility about what we're trying to achieve. And then the third thing really is, its system hasn't changed a lot. It's, you know, for the last few hundred thousand years, depending on where you want to track it, the human stress response is fundamentally hardwired into our system as a ability to help navigate a landscape, much like the image. It's, if, you, if you're walking along and you sort of, you know, you're trying to obviously survive, the human stress response is attuned to look for threat. So, and if it sees threat, to either get you ready to run away or get you ready to take it on, fight. So that's that flight or fight response. Does you well in some environments, doesn't do you yeah. well in uh, others. So probably the best, obviously a wary of time, but the, 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 we could talk for this for hours, but yeah. the grizzly bear one, probably people are looking at and wondering <laughs> what's going on there. That, that's probably the one that really, I think is worth a, worth a bit of a discussion. 
Well, again, yeah, I'll talk about the bear, but the basic premise here is taking individuals in one area and putting them in either very challenging uh, fields in their area or dragging them completely out. So whether you take the grizzly bear at the top is you're walking people up blindfolded to uh, Bart the bear. So Bart's the guy out of all the movies that you may have seen in the past. So he's well trained, um, but you bring, <laughs> you're walking the, the talent up in this particular case, some uh, um, uh, runners, uh, uh, and they're, blindfolded so all they can hear is this animal grunting and pushing uh, you know the dirt around and thumping the ground because you the trainer's kind of getting him to play up a little and so you're hearing this but you can't see it so the stress response goes through the roof because you know something's dangerous and you're thinking your brain's filling in all the gaps in the in, in the absence of information you'll fill the gaps with worst case scenario and then we're just teaching them to try and manage that response in that different way and that's the fundamental premise behind all our training. In the bottom centre, you see a bunch of heart surgeons blindfolded, getting dragged out into the ocean. Uh, you're putting people in scenarios where they get to experience that threat, that challenge, their stress goes up, and they get to just observe and watch. They get to recognise when it gets to a point where it might be beyond them. You're teaching them breathing or other techniques to bring it back. So that's it's true. really that stress inoculation idea that we're yeah. using. What people it, it, it's good for people that have stressful jobs and are, are obviously elite in their own fields but to, to get in an environment where your lizard brain starts to be kicking in with that <coughs> fight, fight response is is really putting them in a different uh not out of their comfort zone isn't it so i think those are those are really good slides um the, the one thing that we we wanted to kind of segue into was uh uh, something a bit different really esports so most people would think well that's not really elite sport but cognitively it is elite sport isn't it andy what, what's your what's your take on that yeah i think uh, part of our role in our community is to sort of think of what's coming and, and to be engaged with those emerging uh, areas of sport or mastery esports is as you can see from that picture there that's that's a finals you can see the crowd the stadium the whole setup it, it could be any elite performance but you know esports now gaming professional gaming is pushing the boundaries and and when you watch and we work closely with a couple of groups tsm being one of them as a coaching sort of uh mentoring program when you watch them try when they're performing on these screens the, the amount of moves that they're making per second the the ability for them to sort of track multiple objects in space they are the elite of this particular genre and from that particular world as you can see from the slide on the right it's a great scenario to learn cognitively take the physical piece out Think about the brain, and that's the part of the human that we know probably the least about. It's an opportunity now to learn about how the brain is dealing with a lot of challenge, a lot of stress, and really focus in because you can't, you know, that, that scenario is a little overkill on the right, but in that testing group, you can do this. You can put them in tough situations and you can put sensors on them that you previously couldn't in other high stakes environments. So you're learning again. You just, how do we understand what they're doing? How do we better enhance? what they're trying to do and if we can understand cognitive performance in this particular area yeah how can we then translate that to say education or surgery yeah. or programming computer you know any field of cognitive performance we can take lessons yeah. from this and then expand it absolutely which is probably you know the, the work that we're discussing as well with yourselves mm -hmm. you know with with the esports um you know we're taking all this uh insight and this data so you know we're we're looking at uh being able to have a, a system that is 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 for the, the the standard person, the common person. So you know we're looking at uh, a mixture of bringing that cognitive learning and cognitive neuroscience into everybody's everyday jobs, whether you know at home or in yeah. office. Uh, and we're looking at then that elite sport understanding and how it translates well into the workplace because there's a lot that doesn't translate. You know, and we're we're, we're taking that, that massive learning experience and then. You know the behavioral piece so you know contextual data being pumped into it uh, depending on you know what kind of meetings you've got your know, the the environment that which your cognitive uh, function is performing in can be very different as you've already said you know if someone's in a, a key presentation or a board meeting or they're they're working from home you know and managing the kids it's it's got to be a happy balance and it's all it's all very stressful today with this always on culture I thought what would be good was to just to give viewers an idea of, you know, where, where, where what you're doing, what we're doing is is blending very nicely together is, you know, on the uh, the elite 
uh, athlete thinking of the ideal performance zone many people may have heard of you know uh, it's a busy slide so I'll, I'll just roughly talk to it you know there's 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 six or so factors that make up that ideal performance zone you know from physiological screening cognitive uh, you can look at the body musculoskeletal sleep clearly is very important to a lot of people uh, your emotional intelligence and then put all that into your work life mix <coughs> you know it's a stressful thing. So all these things we are now accurately able to measure and measure in a way that everybody understands it. And more importantly, can do something about it. You know, and I've, I brought a couple of slides up, just uh, some work we did with, with uh, PwC, one of our clients in terms of uh, dashboards. And these dashboards, you know, you can have them very techy, you can have them very simple. But uh, looking on the one on the left, you know, it's this is a dashboard for somebody to look at and it's just their data. No one else can see it, it's just for them. You know, and it, it gives you an idea of your overall well-being score uh, against, uh, if you want, the people within your office, within your team. Uh, it looks at your biometric well-being and your cognitive well-being. And at the bottom, you'll see there's a, there's a time series graph. So what we've done is we've brought in uh, Outlook Diaries and looked at you can drill down into the peaks and troughs to see where the stress was actually happening and clearly perceived stress. Interesting things in some of the work we did, people overestimated by 100% their stress, you know, compared to their biometric stress. So it's helping them to manage and understand and uh, bring some power to what they can do themselves, you know, and, and again, graphs on the right don't need to go into the detail, but you know, you're looking at your biometric attributes and your cognitive attributes. Uh, and you know, then what you do with all this data? Well, there's clearly then some some good uh, uh, programs we can do for intervention. You know, how do you get out of this mess? Bringing in that elite uh, performance thinking. Yeah, um, and I think that's the future. Is how do you bring sort of an awareness to people? Again, data heavy or just simple yeah, in yeah. a way that allows them to be bring their best self to whatever yeah, family, yeah. work, sport doesn't matter. Just that's Absolutely. Work. Yeah. If you, if you overload people with data, you know, they won't do anything with it. You know, just don't be confused. So it needs to be clear, concise and easy to understand. It might be very complicated in the background, but, you know, the dashboard, it, it has to be easy. Well, one to finish on, uh, Andy, is, is the, you know, obviously looking at Moore's Law with, you know, the rate of change of technology and, you know, that gap there between the rate of change and the way technology is, is more or less exponentially increasing and man's ability to try and cope with it. And you can, you can look at this within elite sport and you could look at it within the general population, but that gap's getting bigger. Um, and how, do, how do you see us being able to cope with that? Well, I think it's, it's funny, you know, I know there's a lot of technical, but, you know, every technology has a product roadmap and it's very clear, incremental, whether it's the Moore's Law or other advances, but... The human roadmap, what's that look like? Who, who's building that? And that's part of what we're trying to achieve at Liminal is this idea of let's make sure the human in the equation is accelerating or at least giving the opportunity to develop the things that really it's uniquely capable of doing so that it, it's in parallel to the technology, not good or bad. It's just you're up. And so we, we're talking things like extreme or, 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 or extreme creativity, extreme empathy, extreme compassion, extreme courage. How do we bring those innately human qualities. How do you make humans more human for that matter? To allow them to develop and focus on the things that the machine can't take on um, in such a way that it's done in a partnership or parallel. And this, this kind of brings us to, I think, our final sort of area of conversation is that sort of as we're working in with humans, I mean, it's this human machine teaming. It's this idea of how do you bring the best of both worlds together? to make, you know, to allow people to thrive and flourish and, and bring their best self, whatever that may be for them. At the same time, allow the technologies to, uh, you know, support that and do it. And I think, what, as I said earlier, right at the beginning, I think the challenge we have is we pretty much move ahead with the technology and think we understand the human in the loop. But I think we, we're still, I think the human is far more complex than we sometimes give credit, so that humility needs to. And so if you're building these tech and, and not paying close attention, I mean, there's lots of examples where I think that the tech is, it solves a problem for us per se, but it's not innately supporting us as a, in our true human humanity. And I think that is really uh, the opportunity ahead is how, how do you focus on that side? Not to say the others shouldn't be, but 
those mode maps and things are all pretty delineated. So for us, how do you do that? How do you, and knowing that the symbiosis of a human machine is just going to get closer and closer, how do we continue to make sure that human piece is, 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 is as extraordinary as an individual or team of humans can be? Yeah. I think it's that, it's, that, it's that question, isn't it? You know, how much machine interference and interface do you actually want when it becomes physical within the body? You know, do elite athletes continually get better or are they, they, are they at their limit now? You know, will we ever see a, 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 a seven yeah. second meters? You know, who, who knows? Who knows? But that's, that's really interesting. I'd, I'd like to, we're out of time, so I'd, I'd really like to thank you for the, uh, the open and frank discussion and I hope everybody's enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, if there's any, any questions related to date, um, we're more than happy to uh, to answer them. Thanks, no, everyone. Thank for you. Thank you, everybody, and Steve, uh, fantastic. Thank you.